Amen. Thank you, Miss Patsy. Listen, well, on Sunday mornings, we're highlighting certain ministries and ministries that you might want to have an opportunity to be involved, and choir is one of those, and that was the reason for this song being placed here, so that we could say, hey, there's a place for you in choir, and we would love to have you. But truth be told, uh, Patsy gave me the words to this song uh, several weeks ago, and I... Uh, as I, as I read through the words of that song, and, and she asked me, she said, Donnie, where would that song fit with what God has laid upon your heart? And I said, that song would fit any time. That song would fit today, and in particular last Sunday. I told her, I said, hey, that song would fit perfect today because the idea that uh, we have a creator that created us and, and loved us enough to send his son to die for us uh, demands change. God is never satisfied with the status quo. You got to hear me now. Listen, God is never satisfied with the way I am in my Christian walk today. God wants us to be growing in our Christian walk, growing in our journey towards him, ever changing I had the blessed privilege a couple of weeks ago to go and serve with a group from this church, a team that goes to the Highway 80 Rescue Mission once a month and serve a meal. And, and I had the blessing of watching uh, you, those of you from this church that do that, had the blessing of seeing you as you worked and as you, you handed out food to, 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 to young men that, and, and older men that, that, that want to change, that need some help, that... that that, that want to take uh, their life to the next level. I also had the privilege after that to go and speak. And I shared with the ladies and the men at the Highway 80 Rescue Mission this story uh, by H.G. Wells. H.G. Wells is a, an author of A Day Gone By, but probably most well known for the War of the Worlds. If you have read about that, you remember what that is. Well, H.G. Wells wrote a story called The Country of the Blind. Now, it was a short story based off of some information that he held to be true, that there was a, a, a village in Ecuador, a luxurious village, uh, setting in, in the most beautiful parts of Ecuador. But because of a, of a disease that was never addressed and never, uh, never cured, Slowly, one by one, the residents of that village in Ecuador began to lose their sight. One by one, they all became blind. In fact, an entire generation lost their sight, followed by a generation that lost their sight, followed by a generation that never had their sight. In fact, in the story by H.G. Wells, 15 generations had passed. Sight wasn't even a memory. Colors, sunsets, the moon and stars that one of the songs Cleveland taught us this morning talked about were never seen by this generation. In fact, they didn't even remember what the eyes were for. Until a young man on a trek in the, the Ecuador jumble fell and lost contact with his group. Injured, still able to see, crawled his way into this village, the country of the blind. He could see he quickly realized they could not. And he began to tell them about being able to see and asking why they couldn't. And, 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 and they put up barriers. They, they thought he was crazy. What are you talking about? This what was sight. What are, you, what, what are you saying? They actually wrote him off to have been a loony took and lost his mind. And he kept trying, kept trying to tell them colors and trees and sunsets and and, and the beautiful water and the... Nothing. Nothing. They didn't see. He fell in love with a young lady in this village. 
So much so that he, he realized he wanted to spend the rest of his life with her. And he went to this family, of, and a very prominent family in this village, and, and asked for her hand in marriage. And her father said, no, you're not in your right state of mind. You, you speak of things that are not true. And, and he kept saying, no, you can. We, we can see, and I, I know of places that we can go and we can get this help to no avail. In fact, this man went to the village doctor and said, can you help him? And the village doctor, after long contemplation, said, yes, but, but it'll begin when I remove these things that he calls his eyes. If I remove those from his body, then I believe he'll be sane and will make you a fine son-in-law. And the rest of the story goes about this choice that this man had. Keep the love that he has experienced in this young lady and lose his eyes or lose his love and keep his eyes. It was a neat, neat, neat story about is this important or is this important? And I would say to you that, that you can end that story any way you want to. If you're romantic, you'll, you'll have him losing his eyes but keeping his love. If, if you're more on the practical side, you'll say, no, he would, he would keep his eyes. In fact, when I told the story at, at the Highway 80 Rescue Mission, one of the young men came up to me afterwards and he said, I've got the perfect ending. He could grab the young lady and run off with her. They can't follow. They can't see him. I said, dude, you missed it, man. It's not it. <laughs> but I want you to think about these for a second. Not, not as much our eyes here, but really, you know, our, our inward eyes. What we focus on, what we set our sights on, what we look at. And if I could give a title to today and what God's laid upon my heart, it would be this, to keep our eyes on Jesus. How can in this day and time when there's so many distractions, so many things to look at, how can we keep our eyes on Jesus? I would say to you, us becoming and being ever changed by God is dependent on us keeping our eyes on Jesus, keeping our eyes on God, the author and the perfecter of our faith. Hey, find in your copy of God's Word, if you would, the book of Matthew. In the New Testament in particular, would you find Matthew chapter 14, Matthew chapter 14, first book in the New Testament, one of the Gospels, our New Testament contains four Gospels, these are four good news books about Jesus, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, all written from similar perspectives, but all with just a little different take, Matthew chapter 14. And I want us to read a story about a man that had his eyes on Jesus, but chose to take them off Jesus. And I want us to see the consequences of taking our eyes off Jesus, but I want you to see the blessings of putting our eyes back on Jesus. Matthew chapter 14, there's not another book in the world like God's Word. Would you stand and allow for me to read Matthew 14, beginning with verse 22, and reading down through verse 33. Matthew 14, 22. If you're there, say, I'm there. Immediately after this, Jesus insisted. Some of your translations say Jesus made the disciples get back into the boat and cross over to the other side of the lake. And when he sent the people home... After sending them home, he went up to the hills by himself to pray. Well, there's a sermon in that by itself. But continue reading. Night fell when he was there alone. In verse 24, meanwhile, the disciples were in trouble far away from land. For a strong wind had risen, and they were fighting the heavy waves. And about 3 o'clock, verse 25, in the morning, Jesus came towards them walking on water. Did everybody catch that Jesus is walking on the water? 
Your translation says that. All of ours do. When the disciples saw him walking on the water, verse 26, they were terrified. In their fear, they cried out, it's a ghost. But Jesus spoke to them at once. Don't be afraid. Then Peter, verse 27, take courage, I am here. And then Peter, who's looking at him, called to him, Lord, if it's really you, tell me to come to you walking on the water. Yes, come, verse 29, Jesus said. So Peter went over the side of the boat and he walked on the water towards Jesus. But when he saw the strong wind, pause, how could he see the strong wind? Because he took his eyes off Jesus. Did you catch that? He had his eyes on Jesus and then he took them off Jesus. When he had his eyes on Jesus, he was walking on water. When he took them off, notice what happened. When he saw the strong wind and waves, verse 30, he was terrified and he began to seek. Save me, Lord, he shouted. And Jesus immediately, verse 31, reached out and grabbed him. You have so little faith, Jesus said. Why did you doubt me? When they climbed back into the boat, the wind stopped. And then the disciples worshipped him. You really are the Son of God, they exclaimed. Pray with me. Father, let us see just how important it is to keep our eyes on you. Regardless of what we're doing, I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. And be seated if you would. Keep your copy of God's Word open because I want us to look through this story and understand that there is a necessity for us to keep our eyes on Jesus all the time. I want to point out what I think are five truths from this particular story that will give us guidance about keeping our eyes on Jesus. Now, just to kind of get this out of the way for two reasons. One, I'm, I'm, uh, I've got an abscess tooth. And I've got a, a dentist appointment in the morning at 8.30. And so if my words sound a little bit slurred, please understand that it's okay. That we're going to get through this. And if I, if I bite my tongue in the middle of it, just bear with me. Because I've been doing that because it's kind of swollen up on the inside. But I'm taking some medication, and we're going to get through this fine. But I can feel it, and I just didn't want you to think that Brother Donnie's not on the top of his game this morning because uh, I'm never on the top of my game, but Jesus Christ is King of kings and Lord of lords, and he's the one that we're talking about keeping our eyes on. Hey, I need your, I need your agreement in this, though. I need to know before we even go because this kind of determines whether we keep going or not. Do you think it's necessary day and time for Christians to keep their eyes on Jesus if we're in agreement with that what about like uh, you know next month November the month of the election is it necessary for Christians to keep their eyes on Jesus what about in my workplace is it necessary for Christians to keep their eyes on Jesus what about in our schools what about what about in church is it necessary for us to keep our eyes on Jesus? All right, then if that's our agreement, then let's look through this, this story at what happened when somebody looked at Jesus, what happened when they took their eyes off of Jesus, but then what happened when they put their eyes back on Jesus? Five truths. Five truths that I see from this story, and I'll be brief this morning, about how important it is and why it's important and how you and I can keep our eyes on Jesus. Truth number one that I see from this text is that God truly does have a plan for my life. That's, that's one reason for me to look at him and to look towards him is that he actually has a plan. He actually has a plan for your life individually, your family, our church collectively, for our country, God truly does have a plan now now if you scan back a little bit in your text you see that right before this Jesus fed 5,000 people with a sack lunch a miracle the disciples saw that if you scan back just a little bit more you see also that the disciples just found out that a man by the name of John the Baptist was beheaded he was beheaded for preaching the good news and the disciples 
heard that. They had witnessed a great miracle, but they had seen somebody for being a Christian get their head cut off, and they're a little scared. They were scared before Jesus came walking to them on the water. They're a little scared because of the times that they're in. They're a little scared because of the circumstances all around them. And Jesus, seeing that, knowing that, decides that they need a little R&R, a little rest and relaxation. And he says, get in the boat and go over to the other side and take a little rest. Verse 22, I called your attention to it. My translation, the New Living, says he insisted. Your translation will say something like, he made them. The idea is that it wasn't an option. The idea was that he had a plan, and that plan included them right there at that moment in time going over to the other side. He had a plan. Did you know that God has a plan for you right now? Understand it in these two ways. One, God has a plan for you beginning with your salvation. Beginning with your salvation, God has a plan. Mine came, I've, I've shared with you before, mine came when I was eight years old. I, I got on the hospital elevator this past week, and, and y'all know like I always do, if I get on the elevator, I've got somebody uh, captured for a few minutes. And I, I'm going to witness to them. I, I don't waste a single elevator ride. And I got on the elevator, and, and there wasn't anybody on there. And we went down one floor, and ding, and the door opened up, and a man walked in. I said, you going up or down? And he said, well, I'm going down. I said, you know, I am too. But I'm glad when I die I'm not going down. I'm glad I'm going up. And there was a, a little pause there, and this man said, yeah, that's what the Bible says. And I cut loose. <laughs> and we had church right there because you know what? This man knew Christ also. He knew who Jesus was. And he told me when his journey with Christ began. And hear me, if, if you're here today and you've met Jesus, you've asked him into your heart, that's when God's plan began to work for you. It begins with salvation. But hear me, this is the most important. It goes beyond salvation. All of these men in the boat had met Jesus. They'd been spending time with him. They'd just watched him take a little fish and a little bread and feed 5,000 people. They all knew that, but notice that God's plan didn't end for them then. God's plan kept going, and I want us to today, I want you if maybe for the very first time, I want you to realize God has a plan from you from this day forward. But Donna, you don't know where I'm at, man. And I was like, you're right. I just know God. And I know this, that God's much more concerned about where you are and where you're going than he's ever been concerned about where you've been. God has a plan for you, Jeremiah 29, 11, for I know the plans that I have for you, thus saith the Lord, plans for you to prosper, not harm you, plans to give you a hope and plans to give you a future. God's got a plan for you beyond salvation. Truth too that I see from our text is that God knows everything about me. How come some of you went, uh-oh? Listen to me. It's a good thing. It's a good thing that God knows everything about you. Think about the disciples. He's not with them. He's on the, up in the mountain. Listen, I have, uh, I've, I've done some writing on this concept of when Jesus would, would, would go away from the group. I've, I've done some, some research for me personally because if Jesus felt the need to get away sometimes, and be away from everybody and spend time with God, and he's the son of God, how much more do I need to occasionally draw away? In fact, one of my favorite verses, it's not my life verse, but one of my favorite verses is uh, Luke 5 and 16 that says, Jesus often withdrew to lonely places to pray. Well, here's one of them. 
Jesus sees the disciples need a little rest and relaxation. He sends them away, and he goes up on the mountainside. But did you catch he was still aware of what was happening to the disciples? You know why? Because he knows everything about them. He knows everything about them. And as I, as I thought through this and studied through this text, I was like, well, I, I wonder, I wonder why he, he let them get to that point to where, you know, he sent them away for rest and relaxation. There's no rest or relaxation when waves are battering against the side of the boat and, and, and the, the wind is blowing. There's no rest or relaxation there. Oh, Jesus knows everything. He knows everything about them. And friend, I, I hope, hope you know he, has, he knows everything about you. Understand it in these two ways. One, if everything is good in your life right now, God knows about it. He does. If everything's good, if, if, if in your boat the water's smooth and there's no waves flowing, God knows about it. If you've balanced the checkbook and, and you've got a lot more money left than you do month, He knows about it. If your relationships are good, family, friends, kids, he knows about it. If everything is flowing smoothly at the church, he knows about it. If your job is going great, he knows about it. If you're feeling good inside, you're healthy, he knows about it. God knows everything about me. If it's going good, he does. But equally, if it's not going good, he knows about it. If the water around your boat right now is turbulent, he knows about it. If the waves are crashing in, listen to me, hear me. Some of you today I know because I'm the same exact way. The waters aren't always smooth. Can you say amen? Sometimes when the waters get rough, we think he doesn't know about it. If you ever get to the point to where you're saying, I wonder if God even knows what I'm experiencing right now, go back to our text and just read that Jesus was on a, a mountainside far away from them. They were way out in the water, far from shore, but he knew about it. And he knows about you. One of my devotions this past week had this verse. I'm going to read it twice because you've got to catch on to it. God gave me this in one of my devotions. I said, I hope you have some devotions. I hope you have in your day a time when you spend a little bit of, of, of the time God has given you in his word. This one came to me from a David Jeremiah who is a great speaker, great pastor, great preacher. Listen to Isaiah 65, 24. I will answer them before they even call to me. While they are still talking about their needs, I will go ahead and answer their prayers. Hey, listen to it again. Listen to it. And, it, and if it blesses your heart, say amen because, guys, God knows everything about you. And that's not a bad thing. That's a good thing that he knows everything about you. Isaiah 65, 24. I will answer them before they even call to me. While they are still talking about their needs, I will go ahead of them and answer their prayers. That means when I don't think he knows what's going on in my life, he knows. He knows. Listen, God has a plan. And God knows everything about me. And number three I see in this is that God provides everything I need. God provides everything I need. As I looked through this passage, I was like, well, what did the disciples need? What did they need? They're, they're fishermen. It's not their first rodeo. They've been out in a boat before. Not the first time a storm had come up. Not the first time they had experienced some type of, of turbulent weather. What did they need? If I was in that boat, and I've been in a boat when the water was, was rough, I needed for the wind to die down. 
because the wind dying down means that the waves won't be as bad and I'll be able to gain control back of the boat. That's what they felt like they needed. And Jesus could have, from the mountain, he could have said, peace, be still. You know, he did that once before, you remember? Jesus standing on the bow of a boat, terrible windstorm. Jesus said, peace, be still. And what happened? The waves subsided. But Jesus knew that they had a much deeper need than just the wind to die down. They needed him. He needed to be in their midst. They needed to put their eyes back on Jesus. They just had their eyes on Jesus when he was feeding 5,000. Can you imagine watching basket after basket come back in of leftovers? I love leftovers. I really do. But listen, leftovers only go so far. Not those leftovers. They just kept going. And they saw all of that, but they took their eyes off of Jesus. He was out of their midst. They needed Jesus back in. Truths. Truth number one, Jesus knows what I think I need. Some of you didn't catch that one. Jesus knows what I think I need. Praise be to God. He knows what I really need, what I actually need. You see, they needed for the wind to die down. And that's what they thought. They thought, hey, if the wind would die down, life would be good. But what they really needed was to see the one that made the wind die down, to see the one that came walking to them on the water. We had a, uh, we had a dog show up this past week at, at our place, beautiful dog, uh, uh, English setter, well-groomed, well a mannered, beautiful, beautiful uh, coat, had a collar on it, no name tag. I couldn't find anything for, uh, uh, on a chip or any information about him. And, and he, he kept hanging around the house, and he'd hang around with over on the other side of the highway. He just, he just kept hanging around. He kept hanging around. That night, he was still there, and I had compassion, and I said, baby, we got anything to eat? And Kim, like only Kim says, oh, well, sure, we've got something in here. And, she went in and got this, got a can of this, and got that, and that dog ate good that night. It was amazing. Uh, she, uh, chicken breast, and I mean, just a, s several things. Because we didn't have any dog food for this particular dog, but we, but we had some food. And it's the neatest thing. The next morning, after we fed him that night, he was still there. <laughs> the wandering dog that wandered up Knew a good deal when he found it. You got to hear me. Figuratively, God has fed you every meal you've ever had. Figuratively. Literally, too. It's all from him. That's why we, we say the blessing before we eat, recognizing that it's from him anyway. But guys, God meets every need that you have. He can provide it. Donna, you have no clue what I'm going through. You're right. I just know God. I know the one that was walking on the water in this story. Top that. And I, and I know. Hear me. I know we go through difficult times. I know we go through, through uncertain times. But here's the one that was walking on the water. He is the water walker. He's the one that Paul was writing about in the book of Philippians when he said, And my God shall supply all of your needs according to his glorious riches in who? Christ Jesus. God has a plan for my life. God knows everything about me. God provides everything that I need. Those three, not up for debate, every one of them. Truth four, God desires that I be close to him. God desires that I be close to him. Why would he tell Peter to come? Why would he tell Peter to get out of the boat? Why didn't he just walk over there to him? 
As I thought about that and studied through it, I came up with these two conclusions. One, because he knew that Peter needed his protection. And, and, and in case you haven't known it before now, hear me. You need God's protection in your life. Spiritually, you need God's protection in your life. Emotionally, hear me. This is real stuff, guys. This is emotionally, you need God's protection in your life. Mentally, you need God's protection in your life. Physically, you need God's protection in your life. So I think that was one of the reasons that he told Peter to come to him instead of him going to Jesus. But I did come up with a second one, though. And I would say to you that it's this, because he wanted Peter's faith to increase. I mean, look at what he said. And I like the way the New Living puts it. New Living says, why do you have such little faith? God could say that to me every day because it would be so true. Because we doubt, we worry, we let situations, we let the water being rough crawl all over us. When truth be told, the one that walked on the water then can still walk on the water now. The one that answered their needs then can answer your needs now. Truth be told, the, the one that blessed them can bless you. God wants us to grow closer to him. And, and right now, right now, at this exact moment in time, you are either close to God or you're not close to God. Hear me again. Right now, every one of us in this room, right now, me personally, I'm either close to God right now or I'm not close to God. Now, you don't know if I'm close to God or not. I, we can all act and talk and walk, but, but truth be told, that's an inside, you see. That's, that's my eyes deep down inside of me. That's not these eyes. So in your own life right now, answer that question. Are you close to God right now? Are you close to him? How close, Donnie? Well, are you trusting him to meet your needs? Are you focusing your attention on him? Are you allowing the waves to, to bat, batter against the side of your boat and it's causing you to waver a little bit? Uh, are you close to God now? Let me rephrase it. How many of us would say, man, I want to be closer to God now? I want to be closer to God. I'll, I'll be honest with you. I want to be Peter in this story. I want to be the one that was brave enough to get out. You know, there was other disciples in there, and every one of them could have said, Lord, if that's you, tell me to come out, but we really only have one. That's who I want to be. I want to be the one that has the faith to get out. But I want to do it a little different than Peter. I don't want to take my eyes off of Jesus. The truth is, we all take our eyes off of Jesus. Please don't be hypocritical and say you never have. We all have. We take our eyes off of him. Hey, when things are great, hey, we're looking at him. But when things get rough and we begin to allow the problem to become bigger than God, we take our eyes off of Jesus. I would say to you that this teaches us not to. To keep our eyes on Jesus. To, to, keep, to keep our focus on him. I think very literally, if Peter would have kept his eyes on Jesus, very literally, Peter would have walked all the way to where Jesus was. But if you go back and look, somewhere between 28 and 29, something changes. His eyes were on Jesus and something changes and his eyes weren't and he began to sink. Help me out. Help me out. Help your neighbor out. If you've ever felt like you were sinking because you took your eyes off Jesus, raise your hand. See, we're not alone. We're not alone. Help me out. Help me out. Help your neighbor out. If you want to keep your eyes on Jesus, raise your hand. That's what I want to do. That's what I want to do. I want to keep my eyes on Jesus. Then how can we? How can we keep our eyes on Jesus? You know, Henry Blackaby in his 
study experiencing God, which I hope our church will do. I know you've done that. I'm just telling you, this is one of those things that doesn't go out of style. Experiencing God will draw you right back to where you need to be. Henry Blackaby's number one reality, he has seven realities about God. The number one is that God is at work around me. God is at work around you. What you're doing, I'm just saying, hear me, God is at work around you. I don't know where you are. I don't know what you're doing. I'm just saying, God is at work around you. And his desire is that we keep our eyes focused on him. That we look for him and what he's doing around us. But Donnie, my ship is sinking. I'd say look to God. He's the one that can, that can rescue us. He's the one that can, I got to keep my eyes on Jesus. How can I keep my eyes on Jesus? How can I keep my eyes on him? 1 Thessalonians 5, 17. I want you to memorize that verse with me. 1 Thessalonians 5, 17. This is, this is hard. It's going to take us hours. It's going to take us. We're not even going to eat lunch today. Because we've got to memorize this verse. It's how you keep your eyes on Jesus. 1 Thessalonians 5 and 17. Listen to it first. You won't get it the first time. Just hang in there. It's hard, I'm telling you. Okay, you ready? I'm going to say it the first time. If you can, you join with me the second time. You won't be able to. Not many of you, it's hard. 1 Thessalonians 5 and 17. Pray without ceasing. Uh, you, you missed it, didn't you? I know. Let me give it to you again. It's hard. It's hard. It's hard. 1 Thessalonians 5, 17. Pray without ceasing. I know you're still going, God, slow down, Donnie. Slow down. Man, that's got too many words. Do you have it? Say it with me. Pray without ceasing. I would say to you that as long as Peter was praying, and praying is when I focus my attention on God. That's what praying is. Praying is when I look to God and I focus who I am in here on who he is. When I'm praying, my eyes are on Jesus. 1 Thessalonians 5 and 17. One more time. Pray without ceasing. When the boat begins to rock a little bit, pray without ceasing. When you're waiting on a phone call and you don't know what's going to be on the other end, pray without ceasing you've got a decision to make and you don't even know what the outcome is but you know you got to make a decision pray without ceasing when you don't know what's going to happen pray without ceasing when you do know what's going to happen pray without ceasing when you don't know where to go pray without ceasing when you don't know pray without ceasing the new living translation which is my preferred for our study on Sunday morning, the New Living Translation puts it this way. I know, I'm making you memorize two verses. I'm sorry. Never stop praying. Never stop praying. That's the New Living Translation of this verse. Never stop praying. Listen, God desires that you and I stay close to Him. And the only way to do that is to keep my eyes physically, emotionally, mentally on Him spiritually staying in touch with him never stop praying pray without ceasing truth number five that i would see from our text i close with it is that god always keeps his word god always keeps his word he told peter to get out of the boat and peter took his eyes off of jesus but what happened when Peter said, save me, Lord? Jesus kept his word. He reached down and grabbed it. I don't know how far Peter was from the boat. I don't know how far Peter was from Jesus. I just know that when he started sinking and he said, save me, Lord Jesus, Jesus kept his word. He just reached down and grabbed him. So I'm not saying that if you and I just walk around going pray without ceasing, pray without ceasing, pray without ceasing, pray without ceasing, pray without ceasing nothing bad is ever going to happen. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying God's going to be faithful. And if I'm not looking at him and I put my eyes back on him right then, God answers that prayer. Pray without ceasing. Never stop praying. 
He's always going to be there for you. Hebrews 13 and 5. I'll never leave you nor. Matthew 24 and 35. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words will never fade away. Do you all know who Ben Smith is? Ben, I didn't know who Ben Smith was either. Ben Smith is not in his right mind. Because Ben Smith has just finished his 401st marathon. Marathon, a little over 26 miles. Had the privilege while I was serving in the military to get to run two of them. Yay! I got to run them because I had no choice. <laughs> Haven't run one since. Don't plan on running one. But Ben Smith just, run, just ran his 401st. But what's even more amazing, BBC uh, News article I read the day before yesterday, he ran 401 marathons in 401 days. Now, you got to grab a hold of that. Now, listen, he, he did, in between his 285th and 286th, he had to take just a little bit of, of a break. He developed a, uh, an umbilical hernia, and he had to go into the hospital, have it prepare, uh, re repaired, put back together, and then get back out. And he, he missed three days in running. And then he came right on, 401 marathon in 401 days. Now you see why I said he's not in his right state of mind. But when I read that, I thought about us. Guys, here's the, here's the truth. Sometimes it seems like I'm running a marathon. It's not just one bad thing. Sometimes it seems like there's 26.2 bad things. They just keep coming. They just keep coming. Sometimes it's like that. And I know, listen, I know sometimes you, you say, Donnie I, Donnie, I hear you, but man, it just doesn't feel like this doesn't feel like I'm getting anywhere. It doesn't feel like God knows what I'm doing. It doesn't feel like, like God's answering my prayers. It doesn't even feel, Donnie, like God is listening to me. Hear me. My feelings don't affect God. God is God, friend. And I would say to you that if they just keep coming at you, you just keep praying. You just keep your eyes on Jesus. If you begin to sink, put your eyes back on Jesus. When you're walking on the water and life is great, keep your eyes on Jesus. Just keep running. Just keep running. Life is not a sprint, friends. Life is not a sprint. Life is a marathon. It keeps going. Just keep your eyes on Jesus. Just keep your eyes on Jesus. Somebody said it this way. I can either go through life or I can grow through life. I want to grow through life, but I want to grow closer to God every day. So I ask you this question before I pray. Are your eyes on Jesus right now? Would you bow your heads? Just between you and God, no one else. Are your eyes on Jesus? You know the truth. You, you know whether they are or they're not. Are they on Jesus? Friend, if you're here and you're walking on water, life is great. No problems. Waters are smooth. The ship is sailing. All is good. Listen. Listen. Be careful not to take your eyes off Jesus. Right now, if life is good for you in this moment of time, just thank God for it. Just thank him. God, thank you that life is good right now. I'm well. My family's well. Job's great. Church is going great. Life is great. God, thank you. Just thank him. But now, if you're here today and, and that's not the case, Life's not great. 
Friend, I'm not saying your eyes aren't on Jesus. I'm just saying make sure they are. Make sure that you're tuned in to him. Make sure you're tuned in to, to the one that can answer your prayer even before you ask it. The one that knows everything about you. The one that loves you like no one else. Just turn your eyes back on Jesus. Now, Father, in this moment of time, this specific moment in time that you created, I pray that we would make sure our eyes are on you. To the one that, to the one that needed help today, I pray they received it from you. To the one needing guidance today, I pray they received it from you. To the one needing healing, I pray they received it. To the one needing a blessing, I pray that they received it. To the one needing to know that you still love them, regardless, I pray they received it. But I pray we all leave here with our eyes on you. And I pray it in Jesus' name, amen and amen. Would you stand, please? We're going to have a time of invitation. It's really just our chance to respond to God. If today you're here and your eyes haven't been on Jesus, but you want to put them back on Jesus, you can do that today. Hey, he loves you enough to say, right now, that's what I'm concerned about right now. Just where you are, right there. Just say to him, say, God, I want to keep my eyes on you. Forgive me for taking them off. You may be here today and, and you see in this church something that you like. You see a family. A family that's far from perfect, but a family that abounds in love. And I would say to you that we'd love to have you be a part of this church family. We'd love for you to make this your church family. My wife and I did that about five weeks ago. We wish we'd have done it five years ago. We're so blessed to be a part of this church family. If you don't have a church family, I pray that you found one today. We would welcome you. We would. But listen, today, if, if as I've talked through this and if we have, have sung our songs and, and we've spent time in his word, listen, if you don't have Jesus in your heart, today's the day you need to take care of that. This, it won't wait till tomorrow. It won't wait till next week. Friend, today, if you're here and you have not asked Christ into your heart, I want to show you how you can do that. And I'm going to be right here at the front. So if you don't have Jesus in your heart, you're not a Christian, would you step forward? Even as the guys are singing, as, 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 as we're in this time of invitation, just step forward. If you've got a decision to make, I'd love to visit with you. You want to join this church? You want me to pray with you about something? Or you want to ask Christ into your heart? That's what we do during the invitation time. So this is his invitation. You answer his call. I'm right here if you've got a decision to make.